Welcome back, everybody, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you want to support the video, audio, and text that is going out, you can do that at patreon.com slash tawahado. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. Shout out to all the patrons. And you can also sign up for the newsletter at aksum.substack.com. That's A-K-S-U-M dot substack.com. Today, our special guest with us is Matt Kratz. How are you doing today? Hey, doing good, Hanok. It's really a, an honor, and uh, I feel really bad. This is probably going to be your first mis <laughs> mistake bringing in someone at my caliber. I can't find anyone on your, your YouTube show who uh, doesn't seem to have terminal degrees and uh, is really a, a very cogent speaker uh, and a lot <laughs> smarter than I am. So I'm going to dumb things down. I'm going to be very surprised if this makes it to your uh, channel if you don't delete it immediately after. Well, I'm 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 glad to be in the production of surprises, and yeah. I hope nobody is actually discouraged in in that way, because I think there's this interesting debate in black communities between W. E. B. Du Bois and George Washington Carver. This idea that mm -hmm. is larger of the integrationist movement and the segregationist movement, and I think I was predominantly raised with the mindset from my parents of deep integrationists and yeah. uh, assimilationists. And, and so I've been able to do that very well. At the same time, the voice of the streets, the voice of, sure. uh, you know, against schooling, the older I get, the more I value it. And it's not that I want that voice to take over. It's not like, you know, I'm hundred percent populist. But I, th I think the, the scales have been maybe 90% integrationist, 10% the other route. And I think the 2016 election, the Brexit, mm. and some of the other things we see worldwide are phenomenons that show that the kind of uh, uh, Fukuyama version where history ended in the 1990s and with the Clintons mm -hmm. is not exactly true. And I think that history is much more of a pendulum. And I think... I think it's swinging in, in the other direction. We'll see how November goes and we'll see how if it continues swinging, at least in the United States where we are. But mm -hmm. uh, in, in general, you know, for example, for, of the black community, of the Ethiopian community, I look at people like Nipsey Hussle, people like Killer Mike, who continue that, that idea of, of economic self-sufficiency. And those are people who... Uh, mm -hmm. I think Killer Mike was college educated, but Nipsey Hussle for sure not. I think he dropped out of the third grade. So, uh, yeah. but I would argue he was very intelligent. And so, you know, we could at least begin the podcast, I guess, with your humility in your intelligence, because I think people have different forms of intelligences, and the way in which they're they're measuring it is is all uh, funked up. I, I like using people's own descriptions, so I'll, I'll use your Twitter bio. Matt C is a maker of the ancient North African comic, Kyrie. And uh, he, he has this Latin phrase there, soli, soli Deo Gloria. I hope I didn't butcher the Latin, but I'm sure it means uh, the glory only to God. Yeah, and, he's and you got the Greek in... too, which is most most people miss that. Most people screw that one up. So. The but Kyrie? I you could, you could do the Greek, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, so um, ancient Aksum from the jump on the coinage in our writing because Greek was the lingua franca due to uh, Alexander the Great, who I know you know about because of your work, um, was our backup language. So on our coinage, we had gz and we had Greek. And yeah. predominantly, I've heard we used our coinage actually for abroad. You know, Domestically, we had like salt, women, and cows for currency. Uh, yeah. But in the foreign markets, you needed kind of gold and silver and so we represented both the way that english would be the lingua uh, franca now on top of that because of the church we say kirie leson or lord have mercy and Absolutely. we we've been saying that forever our good friday service i'd say most parishioners don't even understand it because like 40 percent of it is all in greek it's like taos nae and all all these strange words i don't know half of them myself and uh you know, there's a there's a lot of scholarly work to be done there. So yeah, I benefit from that. The Copts also, uh, the Egyptians who were our overseers for a long time, they use that word a lot. And the Greek, the Greeks too. I think actually that's a good place to start. 
I was watching yeah. some of your uh, YouTube videos and I saw some of the, the epic oh, no. uh, Presbyterian <laughs> clapbacks against the, uh, the Baptists. Could you tell us a little bit about that and maybe the faith tradition which you grew up in? Because the focus of your, of your comics or your graphic novels, and we could get into maybe that title difference too another time. You know, I know some people are particular about it. Um, but I, I think you less, you, ha you have Islamic studies and North African studies. How, how did you get into that? And, and talk to us a little bit about the faith tradition you grew up in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess, uh, I think it's, it's easy to get into Islamic studies and North African studies when you get into the history of Protestantism in a, in a way, uh, like if you think about philosophically, the idea of I guess theologically, the idea of uh, uh, maybe a particular tradition is is uh, straying from the truth and needs to be reformed in some way, and mm -hmm. uh, you're trying to get back to the roots of what uh, the original, uh, you know, what the prophets and sages were were trying to get at. And just just trying to speak like generally what a, like a reformist movement would be. That's what Islam. Uh, that's how it self defines, and that's how uh, a lot of really interesting movements in North Africa and uh, also in um, basically in the heartland of Christianity for many hundreds of years, uh, up to and including through to the Islamic period, is is you know the kind of geographic uh, Near East and uh, North Africa, including Ethiopia. So. Like trying to understand what I was, um, uh, I, so just kind of like starting off. Just uh, I, I didn't really, I didn't grow up Christian. I grew up uh, mm -hmm. Unitarian Universalist yeah. under uh, my parents. And uh, uh, well, talk then, to uh, us a little about. Tell the people I, I've spoken yeah. at two different Unitarian churches, one in North Dakota and one uh, in oh, Southern nice. California. So I'm familiar with the tradition, but for those who don't know, let people know about yeah. that because you called it not Christian. However, I think super yeah. broadly speaking, it's within the larger Christian tradition, but it's I know why you that. called it that. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, they, they would self, and I, I say that respectfully, knowing that they would not identify with any uh, historical creedal Christianity mm -hmm. uh, and they would not um, identify with most of what <laughs> would be uh, in, in scripture as we understand it. So just out of mm -hmm. respect to them, I don't want to call them Christian because I understand that if, if Jesus is not God, it would be, it would be similar to calling Islam a type of Christianity, which <laughs> I think would be disrespectful to them. Just to Some say people that. do. It, Some people which, do say yeah, that. Yeah. Which, which I understand that they're trying to be respectful, but just understanding what their confessional differences are of, uh, of like a Unitarian view would be that there's no Trinitarianism. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want to, even though you're descending from, uh, I don't know, the, the founders of Unitarianism had parents who were in a Christian milieu and they're operating within that using that sort of language and that sort of particular Western heritage of thinking through things, the, uh, they're, they're self-consciously identifying with so many new ideas that, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I wouldn't call them, <laughs> I wouldn't call them Christian. And that, and that's just in order to, to, to just be upfront about what uh, they themselves would want to identify as. So that's, I kind of, I grew up with that. And then I was, um, I, I, I was atheist. And then I met a girl who invited me to a Baptist, independent Baptist Bible study. Uh, mm -hmm. And she said I could go on a date with her if I went <laughs> to this Bible study, which was not a, it's not a good idea, but in hindsight, what she was trying to do did work because mm -hmm. I, I did, um, I heard the gospel there and I heard what Christianity was, and I became, I became a Christian around that same time. And then, uh, but that was still like operating. I was in this, you know, just kind of, which I think gener if I understand your background right, you can probably relate to this somewhat, just kind of like a American evangelical kind of um, 
we call them evangelifish sometimes. Like it's just kind of <laughs> smushy, mushy. Like we're not really quite sh- like maybe it's kind of conforming more to the what the popular culture perceives yeah. more than the other way around. Uh, but uh, you know, maybe Jesus has a lovely plan for your life, and He wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Or you know, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of things like that. Uh, and then in college and undergrad. Uh, I, it, it kind of got a little existentially um, uh, difficult for me to kind of navigate uh, what that was all about. And it was kind of like a YouTube, uh, you know, YouTube was in its early stages about a dec- decade ago. And there are these, um, the four horsemen of atheism were coming up. And there are a lot of people who were uh, really uh, deeply and fascinatingly uh, dis- discussing the biggest and the deepest questions uh you know, at an academic level or just at a popular rhetorical level, but with like the most skill that you could ever have in rhetoric, uh, you know, um, and like the Hitchens and uh, Dawkins and stuff like that. And yeah. so that got me really fascinated. And I, I, and I had to really start saying, okay, well, what do I believe and why do I believe it? And uh, uh, so that, that meant digging into the books in the history books and understanding uh patristics and what people were saying and what they weren't understanding uh our shared uh creedal history what that looks like and what it doesn't um and uh uh the more i understood that the more i understood like uh so so much of christianity at at least from what i was brought up to be thinking of it as and this is coming from a, a very uh liberal and every politically and culturally, whatever that sense means, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, more of a liberal mindset of like Christianity is uh, it's, it's hyper Western and it's, it's, if it's shows up outside of the West, it's an innovation. It's, it's brought in by colonialists in the 20th century or something like this, including into Africa, including into the middle East. Uh, that's, that's, that was kind of like the assumption that one would have when, and then the more you dig into it, the more you realize that it's almost, this is the opposite. It's people coming out of Turkey, coming out of uh, Alexandria, um, coming out of Smyrna or Jordan or uh, um, out of Ethiopia and, and bringing, and bringing that Christianity in, uh, into the West (laughs) before Mm -hmm. my ancestors had ever heard of a Christ. Uh, they were already bishoprics, uh, you know, over much of the known world because that's m- much of the Roman world was, was Eastern folk focus, which is why I was speaking Greek and not, and not Latin primarily, you know, uh, that's why the, our, our new Testament is written in Greek, uh, because of that Eastern focus. So that, that just kind of was a revolution to me to understand like, uh, uh, what I, what I was taught, which, which was, a, I think, a way of framing history in order to understand it as a, almost like an, a, an apology to non-Western cultures. Like, uh, sorry, guys, like, we, we invented Christianity and then we kind of forced it on you. Uh, I, I found that to be ahistorical. And, <laughs> uh, and it made me, my heart, I don't know, it just really burned for like, well, how can I kind of explore that with my particular skills where I was already... Um, I already had a bachelor's in illustration and I was interested in narrative storytelling, visual storytelling. And I was going into a uh, uh, graduate school for uh, medical illustration, which is just a whole nother version of the same thing of just how do I tell stories that educate, but also help me to reflect better on how to clearly navigate uh, technical real concepts that can be falsified. Uh, uh, and so I said, well, let's just start writing uh, stories, basically, that help, uh, that really challenge me to think through uh, what my assumptions have been, I guess, growing up and what a lot of people around me seem to have in terms of what, you know, what would be foreign to our shared cultural history and what is actually uh, a lot more um, endemic or even native to uh, our heritage. I don't know. Does that... It makes sense. I'm trying to, I'm yeah. trying to step it up. I, I really am. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great, Matt. Don't worry. You're doing great. What, what sticks out to me about what you're saying is something that actually reminds me 
and I'll point to one of the PhD guests, you know, that was published earlier this week. This episode will actually be published uh, in, in a few weeks, but it came out this week. I'm speaking on September 10th right now. And that is that uh, he grew into, I think, probably around the same age as you. That's Matt, Professor Matt Thomas. He grew into an evangelical faith kind of in his adulthood, but he pursued the patristics. And the question is like the debate in biblical studies in the English language a lot of time in Protestant circles that he was looking at was between folks from the Refor Reformation like Martin Luther and John Calvin till various biblical scholars of the 20th century. And he was saying, well, I think there were a few things written before then. And so I think it's always, you know, it, it's always telling which period exactly you're examining. So the fact that you went back to the beginning, it there's kind of an arbitrary nature. And, and there's some Ethiopian politics going on around now where people are arguing about whose land is this. And they try comparing it to the American scenario. But the Ethiopian hmm. situation is much messier because it really matters what time period you look at. You know, are you looking at 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, or 3,000 years ago? Because, you know, the people are traceably been there for that long. Yeah. It's like, which time period are you looking at and why? So the fact that instead of looking in the Middle Ages, you went back to, you know, uh, I'm thinking of uh, Cyprian and Augustine and, and people like that, that I, and yeah. even the formation of the New Testament, to look at the milieu to set up your comic, I think is, is interesting. W were there a lot of people in this genre and... I don't know if that's the proper genre. How would uh, let me ask you to self-describe it the way that you were so charitable with with the other kind of folks of, of various uh, branches of religion? How would you describe the genre of comic that you're you're in, and and maybe talk to my audience about any influences that that you had, whether it was in an uh, as an undergrad, as a grad, or even if you you know grew up you know informally getting influenced. Uh short answer is there's a lot in Europe. There's a lot everywhere, but in America, <laughs> basically. Uh, I was actually, I was on a podcast a week ago with some uh, two guys from the Netherlands and they were saying uh, you can get a Dutch comic published pretty easily if it has a historical angle to it, if it's trying to explore, even in a fiction level, uh, just some aspect of Dutch history or global history that, because uh, uh, that, that, that's an asset that, allows it to be an angle into which you can get it into bookstores better and stuff like that. Uh, America is the only country I know of where that's not, that that's not going to get you into bookstores. You know, it's gotta be, um, well, I don't know. I don't know. There's hardly any comics in bookstores here, but uh, it's going to be superheroes or it's going to be um, this whole like culturally segregated, like uh, bicycle history club type, it's like super indie niche uh, only, you know, I don't know. It's the farthest thing you can get from mainstream superhero comics. And, and not, uh, the two of them hardly ever meet. They've been meeting recently, which is interesting because they're all getting into crowdfunding together. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, and I and so I lived overseas for a little bit and I had family oh, nice. that traveled a lot. So I grew up on Tintin and Asterix and stuff like that when I was overseas and then I come back to the states. This is in the nineties. Back in oh, where? The, where at were you? Uh, New Zealand and a bit in Denmark. Nice. So, yeah, it was really nice. And that's when I learned what comics were. I learned that it was adventure comics. It was globe trekking. It was uh, uh, like a celebration of. Um, it was like a multicultural excursion. It was always like. A, uh, you know, the more exotic, the better was, was you were just, you were constantly trying to like, like all the, all the stories are about taking someone familiar and then throwing them in a setting that you yourself are probably unfamiliar with. And then, you know, uh, having, I don't know, getting, and there's usually some sort of historical element to it too. That's just like part and parcel of how most kids are growing up on comics outside of the U S and then I come back and it's all spawn and Spider-Man and stuff like this. And, 
if I had started with Spawn and Spider-Man, maybe I would have loved it. But the fact that it was like, I just felt like it was being pushed on me despite what I was already interested in. It just made it hard to get into it. So I didn't really get into it again until college when I was already kind of looking into storyboarding and uh, had friends that were reading manga and they were showing me what that was all about. And uh, that's where I yeah. started in 2003. Yeah, no um my sisters used to go to an art class and i used to do taekwondo and yeah. so my taekwondo class would end early so i would be sitting there at the mall you know waiting for our parents to pick us up and i would just you know peruse the mall eventually i found this one bookstore and i'm like just chose to always go there mm -hmm. and so i would just sort of go to the bookstore and be that lounger who just reads uh shonen jump which was the publication totally. that had a lot of uh, manga I got introduced to Naruto who blew up much later. I was introduced to in 2003 in, in, in comic form. And, you know, you have to read it like in a different way backwards. And, mm -hmm. you know, you begin at the end of the book and, and even the translations are always a little funny because they're translating some Japanese idioms. But the thing I always loved about the Japanese is like everything was hardcore. I remember yeah. uh, Yu-Gi-Oh got popular at some point when I was sort of getting out of it. I was a little older and the Yu-Gi-Oh that they had on TV was totally different than the Yu-Gi-Oh in Shonen Jump. The Yu-Gi-Oh yeah. on TV was this like watered down. I don't know if it went through like the FCC or what American filters it went through, but the Yu-Gi-Oh in, in the Shonen Jump was gangster. He was playing air hockey with somebody because yeah. they were hitting on his girl and he yeah. attached a bomb to the air hockey puck and it exploded on the guy. He kills another guy with, uh, you know, pushing books over on him in the library. And I was like, where's this gangster Yu-Gi-Oh? So, yeah. Um, yeah, I got into that Japanese stuff. And it wasn't until later that I got into the, um, the superhero stuff you're talking about on the American scene. And it wasn't until, I'd say, the past year or two where I've known about what I see as a change in the means of production in the industrial age and uh, digital age, like transfer to a digital age where it seems like the digital age is allowing the artisanship and the, the kind of guilds that were around mm -hmm. in the medieval days, which allow the, the customization and the tailoring of the campaigns that we see on Indiegogo and, and Kickstarter to, yeah. to happen in a way that is like pre-industrial revolution. Um, so, so I'm wondering if you've, you know, if you've seen a, a change then from, you know, when you were abroad growing up till, you know, now when you see these new technologies, I see you've taken advantage, you know, of, of Indiegogo, you know, what would it have been like if you came into your vocation 20 years ago? Well, I, I, I think the immediate precursor to this, it, it, and there, there are are trends that people were aware of for a while and web comics i think was was the big explosive thing that happened about 20 years ago yes where uh you know everyone had their like favorites in their history tab and they'd like click through on their outlook explorer or whatever and uh they they check their web comics out every week and then uh kickstarter happened about 10 years ago when wow it's that uh, old yeah 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 i think it's I'm pretty sure it's, I think it hit its 10th year in 2020. And it, uh, that, that became a big place, but only really for people who were, uh, who had established like a web comic presence. Mm. And a lot of the fan base was like, Oh, I've read your, you know, I've been following your web comic for five years now, uh, where this direct to your audience kind of thing that's outside of the industrialized, uh, pipeline kind of production thing like you've met me and we've we've already kind of interacted in the comic section on on uh you know in the forums back then and stuff like that so we already have this kind of interpersonal relationship and i i've read the entire story now but now i want it physical so uh you know kickstarter was a place for people to do that uh and uh there are there are some interesting things the past couple years now and I think what's happening there is it's uh, as web comics are kind of waning and dying away. And most people primary, like the average person primarily uses the internet nowadays to just go to social media sites mm -hmm. and, and maybe, maybe Wikipedia, you know, 
which is kind of a social media site when you think about it with how it's edited and stuff like this. So uh, because like people are, it's hard to get people on these destination sites unless it's webtoons or something like this, where they're actually going elsewhere to go see your comic, you have to go find mm -hmm. them on one of few sites. So primarily now, I think it's about uh, meeting people on social media and having an interpersonal relationship with them there was Twitter or Facebook or something like this. And then having uh, one of two, and there's probably going to be more, which I would welcome, uh, crowdfunding sites where people can kind of aggregate there as well. Uh, so it's, it's interesting because it's, it's, there's like this decentralization that's happening, which I really, I get excited about. It's like, it just feels like this mercantilism kind of, um, uh, I'm no economist, but it just, it seems like there's going to be a more diversity of uh, backgrounds and perspectives and stories and creativity, mm -hmm. uh, the more decentralized it gets. And especially for the big two, the Marvel and DC in America, at least where, uh, uh, Comics is a genre to most people as well as a medium. They, they think comics mean superheroes. Outside of America, you can go to Brazil, you can go to Canada, you can go to Japan, uh, you can go to Belgium, and they're going to think of comics as a medium, not as a genre, because every genre is there. Just like novels is not a genre. Uh, no. imagine, if you, if like, imagine if when you thought of novels and it's only mystery, you know, and you, it would be really weird and you'd have to ask someone, so why did you... Why'd you write a romance story? Like that, shouldn't you only be writing mystery? Like that's kind of the, the thing that America has been suffering under, honestly. And so as, as that kind of slowly starts to deteriorate and uh, the mainstream, the money is kind of leaving that, I think uh, it's almost like the eye of Sauron is kind of looking elsewhere for what kind of pop culture <laughs> entertainment to be investing in. Yeah, and it's already kind of gotten all it can out of superhero stuff, or or at least like it's it's satisfied with the big, you know, I don't know, it's putting stuff on HBO or uh, Disney Plus now that is uh, satisfying. I think normies, if I can say, and uh, that that's I also welcome that because that's allowing people who really care about the medium of comics and the uniqueness that it kind of brings that novels can't bring, that TV and movies can't bring. Uh, that kind of the juxtaposition of words and visuals uh, and uh, but something you have to read you have to read these visuals just like you would a book at your own pace like that sort of uh, uniqueness uh, we get to now explore more freely uh, because we don't have this like industrial complex kind of dictating from on high like how that needs to go and how it needs to not go so so I, I like two aspects that I, I would like to, to hear you dig deeper into, uh, make, make sure I don't lose my train of thought with that. The first is we're talking about the kind of big two, right? Marvel and DC. And admittedly, like I said, those are probably the things I read, you know, the most in high school. It was the, the Marvel Civil War that captivated sure. me as a early undergraduate my freshman year before the, the movie came out. I went and made sure to read Alan Moore's Watchmen. So, you know, I was Absolutely. never even, yeah. you know, I wasn't like committed to one side, you know, I was on DC and Marvel. And whereas I saw other people kind of choosing the sides, it, do you have to choose a side between indie comics and the mainstream uh, or the normie comics, as you say? And the reason I ask that is, you know, I have friends who are indie writers and freelance writers, and there seems to be this like anti Amazon but I'm still going to use Amazon in some ways ethos. You know, it seems like nobody could avoid the Leviathan that is Amazon and they use it for something, but they want to at yeah. least minimize their usage of Amazon. So they'll have various links that take them to independent bookstores. And, and I like that in Los Angeles, the last bookstore is one of my favorite bookstores. Shout out to them. They have over a hundred thousand, you know, books that they sell for a dollar upstairs and newer ones, Beautiful. more expensive uh, downstairs. It's an incredible just place. I used to live near it in downtown and yeah. I love supporting independent bookstores. Like I'm a uh, independent hip hop since I was a teenager, like independent, everything totally. is always mm -hmm. my preference. I've just personally never been, you know, dogmatic about it where I see other people in that. So tell me a little bit about, about that um, space. And then if, hopefully if that's not too much for you at once to answer the second part, I want you to tell us about 
the protagonist of Kirie because I, I'm with you. I grew up, you know, Naruto is one of my favorite and Dragon Ball Z was among my favorites growing up. And I mean, even the comic, the mangas like Dragon Ball, I read them. Um, oh. And those are obvious kind of superheroes and, and really like, especially the Dragon Ball Z one. But I also grew up on something called Hajime no Ippo, which was just like a boxer. You know what I mean? Like a regular boxer, no superpowers. And it was just yeah. a really captivating story. So mm -hmm. I, I vibe with your, with your saying that not everyone has to be a superhero. So talk to us a little bit about the kind of the protagonist of Kirie. And then, you know, can you be indie and normie or do you have to choose between them? Well, as far as um, what, what indie means, uh, if you had asked me in 2018, I'd probably say it'd be really hard to make a su superhero story and, and be an independent, like a self-publisher trying to mm -hmm. crowdfund that. Uh, there'd be just too much of a disconnect. Uh, if you if you are still reading comics at, uh, from Marvel and DC by 2018, you're probably going to your local comic shop, your LCS, and you're you're patronizing that store. And what they have in that store is what you're buying. And if they don't have it there, maybe you're looking on eBay or something like that. But you're not you're not seeking out unknown people telling unknown properties that they just made up out of their head. That's just not. <laughs> You know, which is, it's so funny because you talk to these guys, like I used to be in this um, uh, comic book reading group, <laughs> which is so weird in like 2014, 2015, when I was going through grad school and uh, every other week we would do a mainstream thing. And then we do an indie uh, mm -hmm. comic thing. It was at this bookstore that was selling us comics each week so that we would do this thing. And it was, it was a smart business strategy, but it was so funny because whenever we had the uh, the main, and it's so sad when you say mainstream, it just means superheroes. But yeah. there's nothing against super, superheroes are great, but you know, again, like I want to decentralize it. But uh, it was so funny because whenever it was the mainstream night, uh, these guys they get together and all they talk about is is things I never heard of before, like runs, and uh, they they talk about these editor. They know all the lores on the editors. You know, all the Lord, you know, when this guy was working over here and then he, he went over to this place, like it, it's so corporatized, like they don't even see that, like so much of their love of Marvel and DC has to do with like the business history of these corporations, which, which again, is, is fine if you're into that. But like, I don't know, it was so hard to just to get them to say, well, what do you think about the art in this? Yeah. What do you think the about content. this panel? Like, yeah, like when they had this quiet moment when they, they chose, they could have done a bunch of speech bubbles and they chose not to and just have, have the panel kind of rest here. And they'd be like, oh, you're such an artist. Like, <laughs> like we just want to talk about, you know, uh, you know, back, this, we just want to compare to, uh, you know, Magneto could be, he used to be this, but like, what if we told him this way where we just re-envisioned him and, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe Mag Magneto's black or something like this which I thought was interesting, but it's like, I don't even understand like why you're asking these questions. Why don't you just like constantly tell new stories with new characters. But that's part of the legacy of Marvel and DC is uh, we've, we've been doing that for 80 years with a lot of these characters. Like, yes, mm -hmm. like let's make Magneto black because that's what you do at Marvel and DC is yeah. you, is you take existing properties and you reimagine them for a, a new run. And then you, you kind of ask, uh, legacy, you take legacy ideas and then you ask new questions within those new contexts, I guess, or old questions within the new context. From I what know, I understand, you know what I mean? he, like, he was originally an allusion to Malcolm X. And we also see yeah. within the Marvel Universe, before they got the okay to do the film, they modeled the new Nick Fury off of Samuel L. Jackson in real life, his likeness. And then they actually yeah. got him to agree to to do the film which is hilarious when I heard That's actually clever. that backstory. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like I get, I get the whole Malcolm X uh, versus MLK um, professor X kind of approach now, but that you're not going to talk like that with novels. You're not going to say like, let's do pride and prejudice today. Well, I don't know. Maybe you would, I guess now, but <laughs> I was going to say like hip hop pride and prejudice actually would be interesting. That's Hamilton. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So now and maybe, I don't know, maybe I, I'm more acclimated to it too now, but uh, long, long story short, like uh, 
and about around 2018, like they're, they're just uh, because of how these companies, Marvel and DC are owned by larger companies, you know, AT&T and Disney and uh, the shift, there was a shift away from, I think, uh, trying to continue to market to these, uh, I want to continue to call them like legacy consumers, legacy mm-hmm. readers who uh, maybe entered in the 90s and have been there ever since or earlier and uh, try to find, uh, uh, it does, it, the comics don't have to be profitable so long as the IPs are profitable, I think is kind of the idea now where you can kind of generate, uh, you can kind of storyboard out uh, concepts that could could be profitable for TV and movies now is I think what a lot of these companies have been thinking of, which is why and Disney toys. and AT&T bought them. Yeah. And merchandise. So you don't really need the, and it's, it's honestly, this is going to break a lot of hearts, but there's no reason uh, these characters are kind of meta now. And there's no reason for Wolverine or Captain America to be in comics for them to exist in the zeitgeist anymore. Uh, so, uh, as 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 much, I mean, that saddens me to say, but uh, they definitely understand that that they make more money selling lunchboxes than comics. <laughs> they definitely make more money with these these movie franchises. So, uh, as that kind of happened, there's a lot of disenfranchised people who are like legacy readers who just felt like I just I want comics like uh, the way I grew up on them. And a lot of these people actually were professionals in that industry and feeling like the industry is kind of leaving them behind to kind of chase, uh, movie contracts and stuff like this, uh, that they just kind of said, well, I'm going to be making my own, uh, superhero stuff and I'm going to be self publishing it now, which I think is rad. And like, uh, let's, let's find that that market's still there. Uh, these people maybe um, they felt like, they've been left behind, I suppose, but we can reclaim them. We just have to introduce them to something that was already there for a decade, uh, crowdfunding and let them know, like, this is kind of a safe place for you to continue. You can interact with me more. You don't have to go to the conventions anymore because those are also dying. Uh, you don't have to meet me at a signing table and pay me 20 bucks. Like we can just have a YouTube live stream and, and chat, you know, and, uh, you can develop a relationship, maybe an even more, a dynamic relationship that way where just through social media engagement and then I can sell you a comic and and you get that and you're still getting superhero comics but it's outside of the mainstream so, so that I think that's that's another it's it's part of the fallout of um I, I often think of it as kind of like a refugee situation <laughs> where um, especially for me who's like I grew up on the other side of this where the, suddenly there's all these people coming over the border and mm-hmm. uh they've been disenfranchised they've been uh dispossessed of their homes in a way and they need to learn the language like what is this what is crowdfunding what is it what does it mean to like uh tell stories that don't involve characters that were written by people uh my grandparents age like Mm -hmm. (laughs) like like how can can i tell a story that isn't a superhero story and have it be just as impactful as my favorite superhero stories or can i tell a superhero story and no one's ever heard of this. I just made it up a month ago, but it's just as impactful as your favorite, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, Avengers. So, so talk Civil to us a little Wars bit. What, like what is the, the archetype of your protagonist, if not a superhero? Is he a normal guy? Because he looks kind of buff from what I see. I still need to purchase and yeah. read it myself. But uh, tell us a little bit about him without uh, giving away everything. Well, uh, so it's uh, it, it falls within the genre of kind of like a supernatural realism, uh, uh, like a folk hero realism sort of situation where there's a, uh, he, he's a, if you had to pick someone, he'd be like the Hulk. He'd be a Bruce Banner type gentle giant uh, struggling with uh, uh, an intense uh, uh, moral failure that is uh, ruining his life. And uh, he, he exists as two people. He's kind of that Jekyll and Hyde scenario because he mm-hmm. can't reconcile those, uh, his past with his present. And uh, he's also, uh, this, this kind of ties in the whole like Islamic studies and all that stuff too. But um, uh, thinking, uh, portraying him, uh, who I'm writing him as a Christian character. Mm-hmm. And he, uh, but I'm, I'm only allowing the story to define him the way, uh, 
your average uh, non-Christian Roman would have defined him. So uh, with this kind of uh, exo, uh, like otherizing him as uh, a member of a, a creepy uh, a cult <laughs> from the Near East that uh, yeah. uh, met at midnight and drank the blood of its, its uh, founder and ate his flesh and uh, uh, conducted all these things in cemeteries and in catacombs, so it's even worse. And uh, it's probably a death cult, and it's seditious, and uh, <laughs> they probably have dual loyalty. And uh, uh, they're can atheists, really be a true... they're ancestral. Yeah, they're atheists, essentially. And uh, that we were the first atheists as Christians. That's where the term comes from, as you know. And uh, uh, can you really trust them to be full, uh, proper citizens who really care about this country and care for its welfare and its neighbors and also be committed to this... this uh, uh, ultimately, uh, seditious, uh, foreign, uh, this a this alien worldview, I guess, and uh, yeah. So I'm 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 portraying Christian as a Christian. I'm portraying Christianity. I'm I'm trying to struggle through like how how that sort of lens looks like, uh, which I think um, I don't know. I, it, it perennially. I mean, you talked about things swinging back and forth. Uh, I, Islam would be a, a a religion that's probably going through, you know, like introducing itself into the West more than it has in the past. I think uh, it's struggling to kind of understand itself about whether or not it can be Western. But what does that mean? Does the West need to change in order to adopt Islam? Does Islam have to adopt change in order to adopt? It can you know? Do you, are there dual loyalties? All these sort of questions. People ask these things perennially about. Uh, new world vote worldviews as they kind of enter uh these new spaces so uh that's that's another reason why i'm exploring this is kind of he's he, it's a fun um supernatural story where he's, he's bigger than your average guy and there's there's a reason for that it's it's almost like a bruce banner like a, a tragic scenario in a uh science experiment gone wrong but um there's a religious twist to it too that it makes me uncomfortable, frankly. And I think that's sort of a good place. Like if you're going to, the sort of writing that I like is when the author themselves doesn't quite know how they want to uh, uh, deal with this question, but they know that they need to, I guess, because it's, it's the sort of thing that we're all trying to think through. Uh, and I, I want to do it. Um, I want to do it through fiction. So. I'm so glad yeah. you're you're leaning into that. I had a, a former workplace that where you know we were teacher, we were student assistants, which is a confusing term. Uh, but basically, we were teachers, except didn't have the occupational license to be called that or get the salary. But in any yeah. event, we it's a lot of that going on. Yeah, yeah. In, in any event, they told us to lean into our discomfort, and in fact, they used this funny word. They said squishiness. So they said you need to be squishy. And yeah. it, it really helped me grow as a leader to be able to lean in my discomfort this way. And I'm, I'm glad you do that. Two of my favorite writers are J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Yeah. Lewis. And they are people who are perfectly lowercase o orthodox in their Christianity, one an Anglican, one a Catholic. And yet they spent their lives in these fictional wor worlds. I'm finishing up screw tape letters right now be by C.S. Lewis, which is yeah. a whole book of two demons, one mentor, one mentee talking to each other. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's books, you know, have demon like creatures and it, it's really more of like a pagan world maybe even influenced by like norse mythology i personally think he was influenced by ethiopia because gondor oh, cool. and roha are the names of two uh christian kingdoms that my family are from and and those show up okay. as the two of the human kingdoms in lord of the rings and i think there's no way he knew his history too well i think there's no way that's not an homage to ethiopia but in cool. in any event i see them doing that you know, whether it's demonology or, you know, something that could be considered pagan. And, and you're doing that too. You're leaning into fiction, first of all, which not every Christian, you know, into it's is our realm. You know, some people are like against Harry Potter or something silly like that, but I grew up on like sci-fi and fantasy. So I like that. In fact, when you, before you said Bruce Banner, I thought you were going to say uh, Beowulf and Gilgamesh as kind of a, a folk hero influences. Yeah. Oh man. 
Yeah, well, I don't know. It's, there's something about, uh, like, whenever I read uh, some of the most fascinating mm-hmm. stuff on Tolkien and Lewis, to me, are their own histories uh, and how they've kind of framed their own uh, their own influences and what it really inspired them. Scandinavian history has never been, I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't capture me. Yeah. I don't know what it is. But they were in a club. They were in a book club like you. Yeah, they were. Well, interestingly, you know who really captured me? Um, and this is, oh, he, he was not even, uh, he was not little O or big O Orthodox, was, but Charles Williams, like he, he kind of sits in back. I don't know how much you've explored him, but he's, he's kind of the familiar. reason Lewis is Lewis in a lot of ways. Uh, you get uh, the Narniad and you get the Space Trilogy, uh, 15 years of Lewis trying to figure out how he can imitate his friend, Charles Williams, who was really um, uh, bringing in, uh, uh, he was doing a lot of magical realism stuff where he was trying to take Mm -hmm. uh, a folk uh, narrative of a, like um, taking uh, uh, like a talismanic uh, item from the, the court of Solomon that could, uh, uh, transport you through time, but uh, introducing that into his uh, modern uh, 1930s England and just seeing what a lot of proper, uh, normal, very like a mundane uh, English countryside has to do, what that does, how that destroys a uh, reality as they know it when people have that sort of power or the, mm-hmm. um, the, uh, the platonic ideal of 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 lionhood of the lion like the original lion whatever the the ideal lion to which all other lions are just a pattern uh if that shows up in england uh that's called the place of the lion uh, uh what what would that do to england uh, like how how many people would be uh terrified and go insane seeing the <laughs> ideal lion how many people would just instantly they'd fall in love and they would just and now everything around them, uh, the butterflies would be more butterfly-like. The trees would be more tree-like just because they caught a glimpse of the lion and because he, he rested his gaze on them for a moment. Uh, that sort of thing obviously influences uh, Lewis with his Aslan. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he, and that was him trying to uh, – uh, sorry, I'm trying to con- be conscious of your time because I know you typically oh, no, go they're... for like an hour. <laughs> There's no clock, man. Yeah, I typically go that, uh, you know, based off of tiredness or flow yeah. or whatever. But please keep going. Well, just to, just to summarize, like, so he, he kind of brought into that group, my understanding is that he kind of uh, brought an influx of uh, this invigorating sense of uh, how can we deal with... Um, uh, uh, I'm trying. I'm trying to figure out the language for it, but like, how how can we bring uh, like a pre-modern mindset mm-hmm. into this modern age in a way that uh, authentically understands uh, modern challenges and where people are coming from, but absolutely doesn't uh, assume uh, modern imagery or uh, rhetoric or even a sense of reality. Uh, just kind of absolutely up, uh, compassionately upends modernism. I guess for modern readers, and uh, that's he, my mission to, too. I, yeah. I've got to look into Charles Williams more. Yeah, you'll dig him. He's um, uh, it's part of the reason why. Uh, I'm sure you've you've heard of Planet Narnia, uh, this kind of theory of what um, uh, Lion, the Witch, and the War, what all those things were actually about, and it's not just Christology. That's like ha- it's such I a two dimensional thing. Yeah, oh I my goodness, I haven't heard of that. You'll dig this uh, just quickly. It's uh, basically uh, Lewis's, um, it, as you know, like his his professionally, what his day job was was writing a book on, uh, you know, the late medieval uh, fiction uh, or excluding fiction. As I think. I'm trying to remember, uh, basically, ba- basically learning about what uh, late medieval poetry was about and how they were using imagery and symbols to express uh, concepts and themes that were relevant to their audiences. And so they would often use, uh, there was a medieval uh, 
uh, like a cosmological framework that had to do with the, uh, the zodiac and the different uh, the planets in the medieval heavens, uh, and all of them had uh, different uh, personal influences. Uh, like uh, Jupiter, Jove was very. Uh, that's the uh, the celestial influence of uh, this. This all sounds insane, but I'm going to tie it down and just. It's only going to take me like thirty seconds. I promise. But uh, uh, like so, Jove is is uh, he's he's the kingly influence. Uh, he's the one who brings uh, a warm a feast and a fire to his his people in times of uh, the darkest winter, and brings joy and laughter back to his kingdom, and uh, uh, warms the hearts of men and uh, makes the wine flow again uh, when when there was none. And that that sort of thing activated. Uh, that's the sort of thing that Charles Williams was in his own very weird way was exploring. And then uh, Lewis uh, picked up on that and then said, well, I'm going to write uh, this story called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe that is uh, Christ un uh, as Lord, as the true Jove, as under uh, the world under the sphere of uh, uh, Jove as Christ, I guess. So every time we're, we're dealing with uh, Christian imagery, it's going to be through the lens, through this like dimensional lens, like a prism of a uh, Jovian perspective, if that sort of makes sense. And then, and then he would take, uh, he would go, my personal favorite, um, the horse and his boy. And uh, it's not, it, it, the reason why that's so different from all the others is because that's under a Hermes influence. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's, that's, he's, and, and this is, this is all, uh, uh, you know, Christians who are very self-consciously, obviously medieval Christians, they knew that they were Christians. They're creedally not pagan, but they were saying, we're going to take this imagery and we're going to baptize it and bring it into like, all, let all the nations, let, let the heavens uh, proclaim his majesty. And we're going to, we're going to pick Neptune and we're going to pick, we're going to take all the planetary influences and we're, we're going to, we're going to bring them uh, uh, it, in like a, uh, I don't know, like a parade into the, the big Christian tent. Uh, so um, I'm sorry, I'm losing. I wanted to hit <laughs> horse and his boy. Horse and, horse and his boy is it. So Hermes is the God of, uh, of speech, of swiftness, mm -hmm. of twins, of, of um, uh, never quite having a, of, of, of quicksilver. So not having a determinate form, but always being in motion uh, of um, language, like I already said, of uh, of uh, appearances versus reality, so thievery, and uh, baptizing that and bringing it in as a uh, uh, Christ, as true Hermes. You've got a lion who, the first time he ever speaks, he says uh, he he says to um, uh, Shasta, he says uh, when Shasta asks, "Who are you?" He says, "One who has waited long to hear you speak." So it's mm -hmm. always framed in terms of language. So that he, uh, Christ as Aslan would never say that in any of the other books, but he would say that in this one under this Hermian framework. So mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I don't know. I found that absolutely fantastic. That's, that's Christ. That's, well, sorry. That's Lewis. Instead of just taking a parable and say, I'm going to tell a story of David and Solomon, but I'm going to, I'm going to put it in the middle ages or something which I think yeah. is what most people think Christian fiction needs to look like, where it's just parabolizing things. Mm -hmm. Like he's saying, I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take an entirely different place and I'm going to read out of that, the reality of the, the, the Christian worldview, I guess. And I'm going to let that shine through no matter where I take people. Uh, so I'm trying to do that in this, like, uh, uh, Western adventure, frontier, uh, sword and sorcery, uh, romance of the sands uh, story myself, where I'm, I'm trying to embed it instead of with like a Hermian or Jovian influence. I'm just trying to think of like, what is essentially North African and how mm -hmm. can that heartbeat uh, beat on every single page and have that uh, be something I'm reading out of North Africa and not just uh, inserting on top and yet still coming from my own particular 20th century perspective. And then from that, how can I naturally find these sort of themes that I want to explore that are um, 
interesting and relevant. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm off my podium now. <laughs> no, <laughs> there's a lot no, to go you're, with. You're uh, you're uh, you're still on your podium. That's why you're here. <laughs> I tell people all the time. I tell my guests. For me, my show is about highlighting my guests. You know, I have I have monologues on here. I have yeah. monologues on the Bible every week, and then I have monologues on here uh, as well. Sometimes reviewing books, or if I've got a certain subject to do, or you know, if I'm translating something. Uh, I go totally. here by myself and that's, if people want to hear me, there's, trust me, there's enough of me around on the internet. <laughs> you don't have to search hard, even on my own channels, on my own newsletter. And, and so many, like I said, an audio, I have audio text and video for people. So any, any medium that people are ready for it, it there's so yeah. many things that I latched onto there that you're saying. And I appreciate that. Uh, t two things, the one on the magic realism I've always been a fan of Salvador Dali and sure, um, yeah. kind of the, the movies and the film that was inspired by him. More recently, there's a, a producer named uh, Miguel Yanso, and I don't know exactly what his connection is, but he's a Spanish producer or filmmaker who, who lives in Ethiopia. I've got his next movie oh, yeah. already on my to watch list, but the movie Crumbs is already my favorite sci-fi movie of all time. And it's, it's Afro-futuristic and the talisman that you talked about from Charles William kind of reminds me of it because it just, mm. it's just bizarre, bizarre uh, Ethiopian archaic settings and all Ethiopian actors. And it's in oh, a it. but it's made by this Spanish magic realist, surrealist guy. So yeah. you have like a spaceship, you have ruins, you have... Uh, um, uh, what is it called? Like a like an altar, or um, I don't know what do you what do you call it when you have like a, a an icon or an image and you burn like some offerings before it. Um, but it's that with Michael Jordan because it's like in some dystopian future, and that you know oh they, they think like Michael Jordan is God. I and, want this. This is called yeah, crumbs. It's called crumbs. Yeah. Oh, if you type goodness. crumbs Ethiopian sci-fi, it'll come up. And wow. it's one of the most just bizarre things, but it's exactly in the lineage you're talking about. And those are always, those are always my favorite genres, those out there weird ways. And I don't know if I can always elucidate what it is that I've gleaned from those, but I think there's something about that that expands the imagination that has somehow made me more spiritual. So I'm 100% mm. with you there. I'm wondering, do you have any fellow believers, you know, in your community that have ever given you pushback or ask you questions about that? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, short answer is yeah, that's that's frequent. Uh after explaining that my my comic isn't about superheroes and disappointing them with that, uh I should probably start saying what you're telling me and just saying it is superheroes, but <laughs> different. that's probably a better way to go about it. Um, yeah. Like it's, it's always a challenge because I can, as you can see, like I can go off on a tangent about Charles Williams and explain how, uh, uh, you know, the, the revival of pre-modern storytelling uh, or which is in magical realism stories, you know, in Spanish as being like descendant from that uh but it's it's really it's really tough i i usually find europeans uh easier to to latch on to it or uh, mm -hmm. i still haven't been able to find people who read manga to get it because as as diverse really? as manga is i think i think there are like if you're reading shonen jump you're not reading the other one that's all mm -hmm. like high school romance stuff you know what yeah. i mean like i i feel like there's a lot of genres but they're all uh, you, you kind of find your thing and you stick with it, I think. But um, so I've, I don't want to I've lose tried to your... diversify. You know, there have been a yeah. couple of mech type ones, but I don't get into yeah. all the mech type ones. And I certainly don't get into all the kind of romance high school ones. But yeah. there have been a, a few that, you know, have elements of that because of the age of the protagonist. And I think, yeah. um, God, I'm forgetting the name of it now. But it's one of the most epic ones. It's basically the Japanese Lord of the Flies. Oh my God, it's slipping my mind now. Um, oh, but I, it, it's it's also um, I think it's what Hunger Games was paying an homage to as well. Oh, it is yeah. absolutely killing me right now that I forgot the name. But basically, you know, every year a, a middle school is selected to go to this island where they fight to the death. Yeah. 
you know, so that's probably the closest to like, you know, a romance or whatever. And there was romance in that, you know what I mean? Sure. And that was more pure novel. That was not a comic at all. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I appreciate that, that, that I think the big thing behind that is when people ask you this question, how much do they actually care? So, um, my, my sisters have more anglicized names. So every time they meet people, they just move on in the conversation. My name a lot of Ethiopians think it's not bizarre because it's so normalized for them. So Ethiopians watching will be confused. I have, I think, almost never. I mean, you knew me first from Twitter, so that I, I knew you because of your Twitter presence. And it seems like we're on the same page on a number of things. I don't even remember how we found each other, but but that's, you know, that makes sense. Yeah. I, I almost never encounter somebody like absolutely for the first time in the United States where they don't ask me where I'm from because of my name. And yeah. it's always this interesting game of like, do they really care or is it just, uh, you know, what they call a microaggression or, you know, some sort of otherization. And I found yeah. out in undergraduate that a lot of times people really didn't care for the full kind of in-depth answer like you're talking about. Like me, I actually yeah. care about the background you're saying. Like I'm going to go look into these thinkers now because you said that because I'm actually curious but when people are genuinely curious, I'm always ready to tell them. But when they're asking not from a position of curiosity, but almost just from like, uh, you know, what business do you have here? You know, without explicitly saying that, mm, especially mm. in the in setting, I went to Pepperdine, which is a, a Church of Christ denomination, you know, evangelical school. Oh, sure. I, I, would, I would tell them it's from the Bible. And I'd use that because then yeah. they feel guilt because they're like, yeah, oh, I don't know what yeah. <laughs> but if I said Enoch, more of them would know. But when I yeah. say Hanok and they're like, oh, it's in the Bible. They're like, oh, I don't know that guy. Who's that guy? They start feeling guilty. And sometimes I just wouldn't explain it, you know, and other people would be like, oh, is that like Enoch? And I'm like, okay, then we have something to talk about. Yeah. We, you know what it was? Uh, I probably, I'd probably be in a lot more of those guys camps if it wasn't for, moving around a lot and living overseas. And mm-hmm. I think um, that was enough. Uh, uh, I, I actually think it was really helpful. This is going to sound strange. I, I haven't heard someone voice it this way before. So I'm just going to throw it out there. But <clears throat> like moving to places, uh, it probably. Oh, no. Now I'm worried. How should I say this? <laughs> Okay, so we're going to say that you became the minority or. Yeah. Yeah. Even though a lot of people looked just like me and might genetically uh, be uh, similar to me, uh, culturally, we had very little in common. Mm -hmm. And I I was um, uh, like having this. It was just like a few years of my childhood, but having those kind of experiences and then coming back to the States where now I suddenly had, um, I wasn't quite bicultural, but now I had, um, I, w- I was, I kind of felt like another within my own sort of space for a bit, at least briefly enough to where I was like very aware when other outsiders were, uh, you know, I guess like cultural minorities were, were in a space with me mm-hmm. and I would, it, I would naturally glom on to them and I'd want to hang out with them and I wouldn't, like, I just felt like, we got to stick together kind of thing. And they'd be yeah. like, what do you mean? We're just trying to, you, you don't, you don't look like me or something, you know, but to me, I was like, no, like I don't get these guys. They're reading spawn. And you know, yeah. like, so there, there was that, it was enough of a disruption and you, you're going to see, you know, I don't, I don't think this is, um, I mean, I guess there's probably nothing new there, but like, if you grow up in one country your entire life and uh, it's, it's going to be harder for you to kind of, uh like to, to have that sort of natural interest where you're just going to assume that whatever that person's background is, uh, you're going to be able to connect with them and be interested and learn from them. Uh, normally I think the, the assumption, I, I don't think this is a modern thing. I don't even think it's a pretty much like, it's just like, it's, it's built into our nature to just kind of assume unless work that's disrupted at an early age, uh, you're going to assume that like, the more exotic someone is from your cultural setting, you're probably, mm-hmm. 
you could have a conversation with them, but it's probably not going to go anywhere and you're, you're going to disagree or get bored or you're not going to find a connection point. Like it's just not going to happen. But if you're forced to biculturally, like you get to know, like this is foreign to me. It makes me uncomfortable, but this, uh, now I'm really excited because now I understand my own culture better because now I see it from two sides now. And now I, I see your culture now. And now I got to be a kind of adopted into your culture for a bit. So now I can understand you know, and now I'm seeing your culture from two sides as an outsider and an insider. So now I can, now, now I'm I equipped more to kind of engage things from a lot of different perspectives. I don't know. Does, does that, that, is that, that make your sense. experience at all? Or is that, that yeah. is my experience amplified yeah. to the upteenth degree only because yeah. I, I never had a space uh, until adulthood I've found maybe five to 10 people like, like me. And what I mean by that is to my Ethiopian immigrant parents, I was always like the, the worst insult that they would ever lay on me. There were several insults, you know, when I was a naughty boy, but the worst insult is this Amharic word that means foreigner. And yeah. it used to always be hilarious to me because like, I was the one born in America. I was the one here and they would call me a foreigner. And yeah. it's not like I'm born from anyone else. Like I'm born from them. But like the worst thing they would call me is foreigner. And then I resembled them so much, even though in my mind, I probably resembled them 50% or 75% where they wanted me to resemble them 100%. But because of how much I resembled them in their culture and picked up their language and, and so many things that a lot of my peers did not, my peers who are Ethiopian Americans like me were way more assimilated and way less uh, into their Ethiopianness, and so they would yeah. call me fob fresh off the boat even though i was born and raised here because of some of my you know behaviors wow. that reflect the the tradition my parents expressed to me so too ethiopian for the ethiopians too american for the ethiopian americans um yeah. you know for the for my white american friends you know i'm black although some of them will try to argue i'm not really black because uh the family's from africa and then again, I'm with my black friends, but at the same time, um, you know, it's a balance between my Latino and black friends who I would vibe with. Their Latinos had the more immigrant experience like me, and then yeah. the black friends had the black experience. So it was some combination. It was never like no one of those, no single mm. group was ever kind of where I, was I ever felt like a full insider. It was like an outsider that you felt when you were abroad in, in every kind of category until yeah. I met some geographically distant people who came to be some of my closest friends who, who grew up similarly, but just like in, in Seattle, in, in, uh, in Ottawa, in DC, you know? Yeah. Um, and, wow. and so there are a few yeah. of us who are like that, who are into the ancient language of Guz, our vernacular language of Amharic and who know English, who are into, you know, modernity enough to know how to video chat on google meet you know what i'm saying at the same Absolutely. time to read ancient texts and be interested in ancient cultures like you are yeah yeah i love it man i'm a big fan of your uh, your youtube show it's i mean you got Thank a lot you. of i like the the hebraic i think the way we connected actually i could be wrong i mean either we were chatting in some thread about islam or it might have been michael Hebrew? heiser Oh yeah. yeah. He wrote about my, uh, my namesake. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, um, he, he's another person who's kind of, um, I mean, he's, he's right up our alley cause he's, he's kind of de deconstructing a lot of modern evangelical assumptions about what mm -hmm. getting back to our roots really means. And, uh, yeah. Throwing us into what a lot of us would probably consider to be uncharted waters, but are really just good. Yeah. I mean, it's just another reformation. Uh, simple the divine council. Yeah. yeah. The di divine yeah. council stuff is to me, it's invaluable. It, it yes. cleared up so much to me about, um, and, and my disagreements with him, you know, like anything would be around New Testament kind of church structure. But in terms of where I, he's I an expert, that, yeah. where mm -hmm. he's an expert, you know, is Hebrew Bible. And uh, I'll tell you something funny about that in terms of this whole talisman idea. Yeah. I think there was something going on in Wisconsin, Madison. Don't ask me what, <laughs> don't ask me what, 
but there was something going on there and I'm going to yeah. show it to you. So I stumbled onto these three people independently on the internet and they were all at the same school at the same time. So yeah. at the university of Wisconsin, Madison, you have one of my greatest mentors, Dr. Richard Benton, and he mm. graduated from St. Vladimir's seminary later on, uh, or actually earlier on for his master's degree in theology, I believe. Um, and he was never ordained, but I mean, he's as close to ordained as you can get. And he serves at St. Elizabeth's Orthodox church and he's a convert, um, mm. in, in the twin cities in Minneapolis. And he mm. is a, an amazing polyglot, uh, Russian. Uh, I don't know if there's a Ukrainian dialect. If there is, he knows it Spanish, <laughs> Catalan, uh, Hebrew, which he got his PhD in Arabic, wow. Uh, I'm pretty sure Portuguese, I could be wrong on that. And then he's learning Somali as well as Oromo, uh, which is an Ethiopian language. And it's oh, like, wow. he, he's incredible, right? So he got his yeah. PhD in Hebrew Bible at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And in 2014, he started something called the Bible is Literature. And it has now expanded into six podcasts a week, one of which is my own Tawahado Bible study. And so oh, cool. him and his friend, Father Mark Bulos, run one. Their teacher, mm. Father Paul N Nadim Tarazi, releases on another day. I release on another day. And there are like three other priests who release on other days. So that we have the Word of wow. God, a network of podcasts doing six out of seven days a week, the Word of God, right? So Orthodox Beautiful. Christians dedicated to the Bible, which is not always what we're known for, but we should be. So who were his classmates? Absolutely. Dr. Michael Heiser was his classmate. Yeah. And he also has the Naked Bible podcast and all of his books, you know, yeah. whether it be on UFOs and fiction writing or on, mm -hmm. on the Hebrew scriptures. Who was another one of their classmates at the same time? Dr. Tim Mackey, who is the founder of the Bible wow. Project, if you've ever yeah. come across their neat videos on, oh, yeah. on so many errors. So the three of them, the three wow. of them all have huge internet press, uh, presences all about the Bible. And they all got their PhDs together. Tim Mack and Michael Heiser are, are Protestants of different stripes. And Richard yeah. Benton's an Orthodox. But they all went to school together at the same time. Yeah. What yeah. was going and on? All... And that program shut down, by the way. Are you serious? Oh, no. Yeah, that program no longer exists. Gosh. How sad is that? How sad, but yeah. how weird. How weird is yeah. that? We're three of, in my opinion, the most effective Bible teachers, especially on the Hebrew Bible, on the internet. And they yeah. all went to the same school at the same time. And they live in different I places. That. It, uh, impacting that, that field of study online more than anyone else. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah. I, I, it, maybe, it's, maybe there was a particularly bad few winters and they just spent more time holed up with their books or something like this. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I've never even been that far north, so I don't even know if there's anything interesting there. I'm just picturing a place where, like, it's it's there's like tundra, and there's nothing to look at outside. So you just kind of keep looking at your your research topics. And oh, man, yeah, yeah. Like, I've, I've joked with him about it, and I've I've begged him. I was like, please, please do a podcast to all three of you. That would be epic. Yes, yeah, and and it just goes to show, like, um, and. Well, I'll, I'll just throw this out there. I think the most Protestant thing you can do in this respect, it, when it comes to this topic, is to not uh, care about uh, like some sort of tribal Protestantism mm -hmm. and to really to capture the spirit of, of the Reformation, which is really uh, trying to understand, trying, trying to continually, you know, we say Semper Reformanda, continually reforming. So like always trying to update how we're uh, always trying to like evolve back into what the original context really meant and understand that better whenever there's new insights or, you know, and following the academic trails of these sort of things too. And uh, when new texts come out or like there's a new translation of uh, Ge'ez, uh, you know, first and second Enoch or, Enoch or something like we need to be uh, understanding that. And understanding that in light of our New Testament, and maybe that'll help elucidate some of these uh, more passages that we've just kind of uh, 
run a uh, rough shot over maybe some of the, some people like uh, Calvin or Luther uh, may have been um, uh, uh, like eisegetically, uh, you know, um, understanding in, in more in light of their cu cultural context instead of the look the at you pretending context. not to be a scholar and you know about eisegesis. I guarantee you 90% <laughs> of the audience doesn't know the difference between exegesis and eisegesis. Oh, of your audience, I'm sure they do. <laughs> it's yeah, it's, it's called being an internet uh, theologian. <laughs> you, you're, That's yeah. me too, brother. You know, my field of study, I, I don't know if you know this, my actual graduate degree is in dispute resolution. And I worked for a time oh, in the Midwest and in central California with it, but I have not been working in my field since 2017. So now it's my third year away from my field. I've been doing uh, teaching and driving Lyft and uh, translation projects and then my own side hustles to try to like become an entrepreneur. And I always oh, cool. have thoughts of like getting back to it, but you know, people think I've got a theology degree or something like that, but I'm an armchair theologian too. You know, I, I even stray away from the word theology, uh, you know, more just like a, a preacher or a herald. You know, my teacher likes the word herald. I've yeah. always liked that. What, my understanding is all these different Orthodox strains are good about, um, or they, they prior, like there's only like maybe, you, you're not called a theologian unless you're, you're like the person of that century who's uh describing the text you know like i don't know so i i respect that it seems like everyone who gets a phd in protestant circles calls themselves a theo theologian and that's probably um well that's a modern import and it's uh it's probably we, we probably do better to to think about it more from the way you guys typically go about it you know so yeah it's it's fascinating like i i i'm really excited about how things uh, as people's authority sources, I guess, continue to decentralize and people have <laughs> to find networks, I guess, of uh, uh, moving beyond uh, uh, traditional frameworks of how they're going to get their, you know, where, whether it's their news or their politics or their entertainment or their stories or their theology, uh, understanding, like, uh, trying to find, like, a way of... Um, uh, finding and adopting uh, and investing in authentic ways of uh, building communities w and using online to do that, but also uh, critically using, you know, the people around them, uh, not using, but like investing in authentic communities that, that are face-to-face -face that don't necessarily involve uh, turning on the TV. Uh, I think a lot of people, that's probably why a lot of people are going more orthodox uh, with a big O uh, because uh, a, I guess a lot of Western um, strains of uh, evangelicalism or just like theism, like religious institutions are kind of breaking down and people are kind of looking for something that feels uh, that really does uh, seek to understand uh, these scriptures in, in, in the context that really does make sense and have a systematic framework that, uh, clarifies things and also has application today. I hope, I hope I made some Agreed. sense of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, of course I would always get excited when they go big O Orthodox, especially if they go OO or Oriental Orthodox, uh, as we sure, call sure. Uh, yeah. one of the many names they, uh, they've thrust upon us. I don't actually like that name, but it, but it, it helps, you know, for yeah, is that terms a, um, of people understanding it. That's a, yeah. What would you guys, I mean, would you, are you, I mean, Ge'ez is just the liturgical language, right? That would that's be... That's our specific um, part or rite, R-I-T-E, rite. Okay. I do like referring to the churches linguistically. I think it makes sense of the history more, especially hmm. the way yeah. you described Greek. So, for example, you know, they typically say Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox, or they'll say... Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonian, referring to a particular council where we parted ways. Yeah. To me, those terms are not helpful. So I okay. like calling them the Greek Orthodox um, or simply the Greeks because the, the basis of their rite, R-I-T-E, or their liturgical rubric and the scriptures and all that is Greek culture, Greek language. 
For us, mm-hmm. it's Afro-Asiatic. Amongst the, uh, you know, this is an argument. Um, people argue that there are five original, what they call apostolic sees or thrones. I argue mm-hmm. there are three because I think two were political appointments. So that to me invalidates them. Whichever way you count it three or five, two mm-hmm. of them, and, and this is where it matters, two of the five or two of the three were Alexandria and Antioch. And the, the kind of city dwelling westernized people spoke Greek in Alexandria and in Antioch, but the more indigenous country folk spoke Syriac and they spoke yeah. Coptic, which are both under the Afro-Asiatic branches of languages. The yeah. Ethiopian church, it gets its bishopric from Alexandria, but is highly influenced by the Syriac in terms of its monasticism. And so mm-hmm. it's not always clear, you know, what is what, but we have both of those influences and then our own contributions. And then you include the Armenians who got their basic stuff from the Syriac, the Indians yep. who got everything from the Syriac yep. and the Eritreans are the same as the Ethiopians. So mm-hmm. that, that group, our group, I, either the Afro-Asiatic Orthodox or simply the Afro-Asiatic. And then of course, you know, the Romans or the Latins, right? Because Latin is the base language, uh, the Vulgate and the traditional mm-hmm. Latin mass and, and everything that they do. So the Latins, the Greeks and, and the Afro-Asiatics is, is what I typically say. I, I dig that. I mean, that, that does seem to, I mean, you're going to find creedal traditions following language lines. Yep. Yeah, I can. Huge, I can, I can get huge that. cause of the differences, in my opinions. Really, the, think, yeah. The theology you mentioned Platonism earlier. The, the greatest enemy of Alexander the Great was the Old Testament. Um, my teacher believes wow. it was written specifically with him in mind and and the uh, what the early church differences what a lot of them uh, were based on was that the view was the Greek philosophers were to the Greek peoples what the Old Testament was to the Jews and so the thought yeah. was you just take, Platonism or Greek philosophy, and you blend it absolutely with the the kind of Hebrew mind, and uh, and and a lot of the the controversies are based off when you go back to it. They're based off specific Greek terms that often were not ever in the Bible. They were yeah. terms that people came up with to express ideas that came out with the Bible and the big schisms, they all come from those. So that when you look at like the Syriac and the Ethiopian church, a lot of the times, you know, they just, you know, it didn't make sense. Um, There's a friend of mine who's a priest. He wrote a book on our Christology called Miaphysite Christology because they often called us Monophysites without getting too much in the Christology. And one of the big things he said is like, like when you translate it, it, it literally means something different because of the base words of the language, like a word like nature, nature, essence, these types of, of words, um, they, they come with certain connotations that, that change depending on what, what language group you're, you're in, which is why I, yeah. you know, I, I obsess about language a little bit. Um, but, no, it's, uh, it's beautiful. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's how you understand a lot of these concepts as you should. Yeah, there's a book um, written by is it Donner? Uh, I'll, I'll have to send it to you after. Um, Please. It's called the uh, John's uh, Logos Theology in the um, uh, Aramaic Targums. Uh, that's that's the connection point, and, and he basically wrote like a 500 uh, page uh, thesis on a lot of. Um, the logos theology that you find in the Gospel of John is not uh, like a um, Neoplatonist. Uh, it's it's not him trying to do that blending that you're talking about. Uh, it's it's Greek language to uh, translate Aramaic concepts that are embedded uh, deeply and authentically in. Uh, in the, the Bible of first century synagogues, which was written in that, Syri- that 
Aramaic that you're talking about. So like yeah. a lot of that, um, the concept of uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. If, if, I mean, if you're reading the Targums, uh, that sort of language, it, which I, I just think is fascinating. Uh, and um, Heiser helped me kind of get behind this sort of thing too, is that, I mean, you know that the Targums, they're not just, they're not word for word translations in the, no. the modern sense that we expect where, uh, we always come up with a new every every ten or twenty years is a new English translation of the Bible, and it's always trying to get to this sort of um, this ever this moving target of what precision means, I guess, from our academic perspective. But a, a, a targum is is different because there's all these kind of expansions and contractions, and it's it's trying to conceptually capture exactly what's going on. But there's there's embedded within that as well are these. Uh, uh, I, don't, I, I don't even want to call it additional information because that's that's not how they would have thought of it, and that's not how the first Christians thought of it. But um, there's a lot of uh, concepts about the the Word of God. Uh, uh, when the Word of God came to Moses, uh, the Word of God was a personal manifestation of God, who was was God and yet was was from God and. Uh, distinct from God and yet had his essence. Uh, and that that's um, how the Aramaic speaks of the word in a personal sense. And uh, so that's what John, as, as a good uh, first century Jew, Messianic Jew, is understanding uh, his own, uh, you know, what he grew up reading and listening to in, in, uh, in synagogues. Uh, which is obvious, you know, synagogue, both synagogue and um, ecclesia are just Greek words for, you know, the assembly. I'm sure there's a Ge'ez thing going on. With we that too, we transliterate but... the word ecclesia. It's, it's a common girl's name as, as okay. well. Yeah. Oh, that's um, a nice girl's name. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we use the word ecclesia, um, which is just, we have a lot of Greek transliterations, but the Targum tradition yeah. almost exactly exist in Ethiopia and there's a cognate. So we say Tirguami. But if you could hear Targum Tirguami. Yeah. It's the same uh, concept. Right? It's the yeah. same concept and the words themselves are Semitic cognates. Yeah. And the tradition exactly exists. So in the Targum, mm. the Hebrew is the holy language. So they read it in Hebrew. Someone reads it and Reading in our culture is not selfish. You read out loud because 80% of the society is illiterate. So they yeah. recite it or they read it out loud. And then the other person does the Targum in Aramaic so that they explain. We, we have that along with something mm. called Hatata, which means an investigation or a research. And so yes. they use Gez to read the text and mm. then they explain it or they Sometimes they give like 30 synonyms in a, in a row. They, it's called the andimta too, because um, when there's cool. one meaning, they say bo, which means one meaning. When there are multiple meanings, they say it means this, and it means this, and it means this. And sometimes it'll go on for, for pages. And Wow. <laughs> so excuse me. Sorry. They have this for the Old Testament, the New Testament, the patristics. And then there's a book called the Book of the Monks, which has three different Syriac monks. And so, mm. it, it, which is the, the literary Aramaic. So uh, that's exactly the same situation um, going on in Ethiopia, except with, uh, instead of Hebrew and Aramaic, it's Gez and Amharic. And I got to write about that actually in a, in wow. a paper uh, not, too, not too long ago. It, oh, it's so that. fun. Yeah, that that connection exactly the way that you described it. I I I noticed. Um, uh, uh, I apologize if this <laughs> this almost seems. I mean, it is crass. Uh, but um, who's the guy that talks about? He's the, he's on YouTube a lot, um, and he talks about the the uh, the tablets of the, the Mosaic Covenant. Graham and, Hancock. Yeah, Graham Hancock. Yeah, like. <clears throat> Okay, this is me segueing back into what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It's so fascinating to me. Ethi like Graham Hancock helped me. This is, is going to sound dumb, but he helped me to ask um, very interesting questions. I don't agree with his answers, mm -hmm. but I really like his questions. 
and one of the things is 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 he he kind of helps bring a popular audience into kind of turning to Ethiopia and in, in trying to in asking like well, what are the origins of a lot of these traditions and it seems to me like that's that's a, a new a newer and burgeoning field of just trying to understand you know how far back does Ge'ez go uh, how far back like I mean Wikipedia will tell me the third century I guess is when maybe that that's like um, that's the official time when um, mm -hmm. that's that's when Christian time began I guess in an official sense but it, it's, it's it's hard to say so yeah. Ge'ez predates that um, yeah. there are different accounts and so part of the, the, the issue is the verbal language versus the written language. And I sure. think I could be, I could be wrong. I think the written language goes potentially as far back as a thousand BC. Um, nice. and, and wow. some of that delves back into Sabaean as well, which yeah. is, you know, the same South Semitic script. There's a, a guy, professor Al Jalad, I think his name is. He studies oh, yeah. a language Welcome. called, yeah, yeah. He, you know, when he does his Sephatic, there's yep. no Sephatic emojis. So when he does his Sephatic, I don't know Sephatic, but he uses the South Sabaean alphabet. And yep. the South Sabaean alphabet is the pre alphabet of my alphabet. So that when he writes the Sephatic on Twitter, it, not when he takes pictures of the rocks on, on the rocks, I can't read shit. But when yep. he has the, the script and he writes it out, I freaked yeah. out the first time I saw it because I could read it. I had no idea what it said, but I could read it and pronounce it. Yeah, phonetically. And I was like, exactly, phonetically. The way an English speaker could read German without knowing what it was that was being said. At the same mm -hmm. time, some of the words would be the same, right? Like, my is water universally across uh, Semitic languages. Mm -hmm. Things like mm -hmm. my and Abba for father. Like, some of those things are universal. So, some of those things... I would catch and I'd be like, whoa, do I know Sephatic? And I was like, no, I don't know Sephatic. Um, but but that was it yeah. was interesting. And there are a lot of different what I think were colonial cultural anthropologists mm -hmm. who had this view that I think is more and more disproven, but there are just so many things that haven't been fully proven yet. We don't know. And so mm -hmm. the original thesis was the Semitic speakers in Ethiopia are Arab invaders who came 2,000, 3,000 years ago and created civilization because there's no way indigenous Africans could have created the civilization that the Ethiopians did, right? Yeah. Um, sure. And maybe, but, you know, I did, I did a test with 23andMe, and it says that my family's been in Africa for 10,000 years. Maybe 23andMe <laughs> is bullshit, or yeah. maybe, maybe it wasn't. Arab invaders 3000 years ago, maybe it was Arab invaders 10,001 years ago. You know, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I've heard some people say it was 40,000 years ago. Um, but you see some, a lot of genetic diversity there. There are three main groups in, in the horn of Africa, which are Nilotic speakers, Cushitic speakers, and Semitic. I yeah. think the vast majority of Ethiopians are a blend of mm. Cushitic and Semitic and we've mixed for so long that it's not even distinguishable, but there are some people who are certainly more Semitic and some more Cushitic. Yep. Uh, but there's even arguments. Me and El Jalad uh, had a back and forth one time about nice. the origin of, of Afro-Asiatic languages. So within Afro-Asiatic, you have Cushitic and Semitic. Half the Semitic languages are in the Middle East and half are in uh, Ethiopia. Some people believe Semitic languages began in Mesotam Mesopotamia. Some people believe that it began somewhere in Yemen. And some people believe it began in Ethiopia, where there's a ton mm -hmm. of Semitic language diversity. Every Cushitic language is in Africa. None are in the Middle East. And so that's yeah. the question. Yeah. If, if Afro-Asiatic begins in Africa, it makes sense why it eventually gets to the Middle East. If it started in the Middle East, there should be some Cushitic languages left. There should at least be one, um, yeah. you know, or why are they in the same branch? So there's, there's just still a lot of unanswered questions. Um, but yeah. that goes to your question of for sure the script started in the Middle East, which is why uh, it's f split 50-50, I think, in the field now where it used to be all Middle East, it's more 50-50 now. And people yeah. who say Middle East, it's because the evidence they show is that the script is from there. 
but how long yes. was the verbal guz spoken and what mm -hmm. was the precursor Semitic language to it? I don't know. Yeah. And I don't know who does. Well, and, and that's one of the great things about uh, Professor Al Jalad's work is that uh, it, it really helps clarify and distinguish the difference between script and language because there, there was so there was a huge uh, diversity of scripts uh, for Arabic. And now there's now there's one for the most part. And uh, just because uh, something is written a different way, obviously, doesn't mean it's it's uh, spoken differently, you know, dramatically differently. That's and, right. I think he also, found a whole text, was it? I think he might have even published one of Arabic written in, in the Greek script. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, the D Damascus uh, Psalm. Uh, I think it's, uh, I think he's, he's saying late 7th century, early 8th. And uh, that's interesting because that's written in, um, that's using a dialect. You can tell because it's in Greek. You can see the vowelizations of, of what it would have been in, in Arabic, and it it it's someone, it's authentically a, coming from a Greek uh, from a a Semitic Christian rite, R I T E, but it's um and it's it's speaking a uh, Hijazic Arabic, which I think is interesting, but uh so it's it's basically people who had not uh I guess the theory is that people had learned to speak the dialect, but they hadn't learned the script yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people, uh, I mean, who am I? I I'm nobody, but um, I, I'm a little, I, my understanding is that that's rarely the case. People don't usually switch a dialect without first learning the uh, script. So um, I think, I think, there's it, some, I some think the equivalent is like with the Russian Orthodox who encountered the 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 Inuit? I've heard some people say that actually they prefer Eskimo. I don't even know what the right word is anymore. But, oh, exactly. uh, <laughs> oh, then, yeah. Well, a lot of a lot know. of Native Americans prefer Indian. Like, yeah, yeah. When I went to North Dakota, they said American Indian, and in California, I had grown up saying Native American, but they all said American Indian. Anyway, yeah. the Eskimo or the Inuit, whatever the proper term is, when yeah. when they had encountered them, that years later when their language was endangered, the language was preserved because of the Orthodox Christians who translated the Bible. I don't know what script they used, but I believe wow. that they only had a verbal language before. And so they had committed the entire biblical text. And it was like one of the first, if only texts that they've ever had so that the yeah. beauty of their language now in its endangered form was preserved to a large extent because of those people. So it's interesting if this yes. dialect maybe didn't have a written script associated with it, whereas mm -hmm. maybe other dialects of Arabic did that this already like well-used Greek may have preserved some of the beauty of this dialect that would have been lost or modernized in, mm -hmm. in other Arabic scripts, an even funnier angle just to mention is that the Psalms is a original Hebrew text translated into Arabic, transliterated into Greek. There's all types of cultures there. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you just love, I mean, th I feel like that's where excitement really happens is on that, that borderland, I guess, uh, between, I mean, it's not even really, it's its own thing. It's not, it's not, um, even calling it a borderland is kind of denying its legitimacy, I guess, as a, as a, as a culture in itself. But, uh, that's, that's where I really get excited. Um, I mean, you're talking about like, uh, Yemen and Ethiopia having a, a, a similar, uh, language and a script heritage. And, uh, if you're looking at a map and you see there's, there's the Red Sea in between them. So there must be like, I see a geographic boundary and it's, this one's blue. So that must be even more of a boundary and I can't swim across that. So there, you know, I'm going to expect cultural differences. I'm going to expect maybe someone has to invade the other for their, mm. them to ever be any kind of a, a cultural similarity. Some disputed islands, by the way. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Even today. Yeah. Yeah. yeah even today. Uh, with Eritrea, of course, because Ethiopia, the nation state is landlocked, but you know, Eritrea. Yeah. Well, that's, it, it's like, there's so many things that appear to be boundaries geographically, but are really just kind of like highways, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. like a lot of these oceans, I mean, you see, you see going back 10,000 BC, a lot, I mean, the way our ancestors were traveling through the, 
the planet was uh, following the coastlines more often than not, or following waterways, which just makes sense. And, um, and tra- navigating both sides of that, those waterways. Uh, so a lot of times what seems to, seems to us today to seem like uh, uh, a cultural boundary that should go back through time because those, col- those geographic boundaries are always there are often, oftentimes um, it's kind of like, it's kind of flipped. Like there could be a desert and it's hard to see a desert on a, on a, on a globe map, but the desert could be more of a boundary than the ocean was. Uh, oh yeah. You know, which that, those sort of things excite me. So, so like Westerns, uh, um, th- those are kind of spaces. Like I've, I grew up around a lot of Westerns for some reason. So I, I really dig those. And those are like those liminal spaces that are, that are these really interesting cultural moments that uh, uh, to people who are entering those spaces, uh, you know, the Western genre, the, the time in Western America with cowboys and all this stuff, like this frontier spirit of like, uh, we're, we're really on the edge of what we're used to. And yet at the same time, it's, it's a, it's a clash between what we consider to be an edge, but also what other people's, you know, may consider to be their homeland or like we're th- that sort of like miscommunication of like where, where cultural boundaries can and should be is really exciting. Uh, so that's probably one reason why, um, I spend so much time just <laughs> getting to know cultures that don't um, that don't relate to what I see around me, but also uh, trying to like tell stories that uh, um, uh, aren't aren't within my particular comfort zone. But it's be- it's all because I know that like again that like what look like boundaries are often bridges. Uh, the, the more mm-hmm. I I get to know where other people are coming from and those differences, uh, the more I can actually understand what our shared that, you know, what the deeper underlying shared experience is. It's just, maybe I have to learn a new language to do it. But uh, see, I, I love that that you are doing that, especially from the linguistic, cultural, religious perspectives. What's, what's so funny as we close up here is that Pat Buchanan, I think is one of the most fascinating characters in American oh, yeah. politics. <laughs> and he is the opposite end of the spectrum from you in this yeah. particular analysis. I disagree with him on a lot. Where I agree with him is on both of us being anti war, but for totally different reasons. He True. has, you know, what could arguably be considered, uh, depending how you want to argue it, a racist perspective about preserving the sort of genetic makeup and culture of the United States as it is now as much as possible, which drives him not wanting to have war because he believes that the wars build a bridge with the cultures. For example, the war in the Philippines will lead to more Filipinos coming to the United States in the (laughs) aftermath. And it's one of the most, in my opinions, convoluted, reasons to be anti-war but i'm happy that he is anti-war but you get excited by the the stories that are unlocked by those bridges that are being built so one one more time as we are closing out here make sure you plug everything as possible and make sure you you dm me every link you want me to throw up on on youtube but let everybody know where they can they can access your projects yeah uh if you follow me on twitter at uh matt krotz uh, that's that's the social media I'm usually using, and I'm I'm throwing up a lot of info. Uh, I'm sorry the lights have gone down, and I don't want to like jostle the camera to go turn it on. Or otherwise, I'd show you uh, 280 pages of comic book, uh, which you you can read. Uh, it's my love letter to North Africa. Uh, hope hope to write future love le- letters to other uh, countries I've never been to. But um, you can find me on Indiegogo. Uh, we've got a second campaign. Uh, the first book, uh, The Curse of the Macedonian Scroll, you can get that as well as the second book, uh, Exiles in Wasteland, on Indiegogo. Uh, Kyrie, that's K-Y-R-I-E. You just search for that, and you should be able... You're either going to find um, a Celtics point guard, or you're going to find... <laughs> uh, 
and PDA 80s. Irving. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everyone's like Kyrie. Yeah, yeah. sure. Whatever, whatever helps you spill it. But yeah, um, yeah uh, that that's that's what we're doing. We got fun plans for 2021. Uh, we hope to take uh, we we the Kyrie verse and go uh, in more interesting, exciting directions and kind of explore those kind of cultural boundaries and uh, seeing familiar things from new perspectives kind of thing that we're doing uh, just, just kind of onward and upward. Uh, so yeah, thanks for Beautiful. having me on Hanok. It's been a, a real pleasure. Uh, I, I've been trying to hype myself up the past couple of days. Like, I don't know, like I, <laughs> I'm not even a deacon. Like I can't even like, keep up with this. Like it's not. It's not gonna pan out. It's uh, okay. But... We have we have all stripes. We have all we have all shapes and stripes. And I would not have invited you on the program if I didn't think the story would be valuable to me and to my audience. So thank you again for coming on. Cool. Well, it's been a pleasure. Pleasure and an honor. <laughs>